I said, Becky's been gone for over two years now, Lord. I'm so lonesome. I said, I'm going to just pray and ask you, Lord, maybe bring somebody else in my life just as a friend. Because I'm so lonesome, Lord. You know what's going on. So I got on my knees. And I said, you know, I don't even know how to pray, Lord. I just give it to you. I just give it to you. You just take it and do whatever you want to. Just make me content in Christ. Amen? Amen. So sometimes when we don't know what to pray for, we just need to look to him and just, Lord, you know my heart. I give it all to you. And he'll take care of it. He'll tell you, just say thank you. That's exactly right, brother. Dan. And he'll take care of that need. Whatever it is, you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you, he says. All right. Look, if you would, quickly. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 and one verse of Scripture. We looked at this so many times before. I just want you to think about something this morning. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said in verse 11. Verse 11. We'll just look at this one verse. And that knowing the time. Knowing the time, knowing what time it is, he's saying. We know what time it is. And that now it is high time, which means it is already time to awake out of sleep. Why? For now is our salvation. And he's talking about not when we get saved or being saved. He's talking about our final salvation, our final consummation. When Christ comes back for us and, and he raptures us, takes us up. And as we're going up, we're going to be changed like that in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And we're going to have a body just like the glorified, resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. That part of our salvation. He said it is nearer than now than that we would believe. Than we would believe. Now, you can see the excitement. Can't you see his excitement there? He is excited. The Apostle Paul, as you know, we've said this so many times, he believed that Jesus was coming in his lifetime. He really, and the other writers of the New Testament as well, they believed that Christ was coming in their lifetime. They believed in eminence, that Christ could come, that Jesus could come at any time, at any moment, in any place, any way. No signs need to be fulfilled for Jesus to come for the church. So Paul says, and again, you can see, you can sense, you can, you can feel his excitement here. Now, I think we ought to be the same way. Especially in the light of the things that's happening in this world today. And not only in Israel, but in America. And in Europe. And everywhere, all over the world. The whole world is in chaos, my friends. And the Bible said it would be like that when the son of perdition, the man of sin, steps onto the stage of human history. The man with a plan that once got the answers, it seems like. The quintessential politician, the Antichrist. The whole world is going to be in chaos. You can read this in, book, in Daniel. You can read it in Matthew. You can read it in Revelation. It just tells us that what we're seeing today, the stage has already been set for his appearing. Now, we're not looking for him. We're looking for, not for the Antichrist. We're looking for the Christ. Amen? Amen? But we ought to be excited as we see these things. Again, look at the uh, passage that we looked at in, 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 uh, this morning in our scripture reading. In uh, Matthew, Matthew chapter uh, 16, Jesus was scolding the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He says this to them again. He says, uh, you, the Pharisees also, the Sadducees came, tempted him, desired him, that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, when it is evening, you say, and he goes on to give these things about how the weather's going to be. But then he said this in verse 3, 3b, O ye hypocrites, hypocrites, you can discern, you can judge the face of the sky, but can you not discern the signs of the times? In other words, all these things I've been doing, all these miracles I've been performing, I turned the water into wine, I have raised the dead, I've healed the lame, caused the blind to see, and my messages that I have again, the words I've been sharing, you ought to be able to see that clearly that these signs are pointing to me as the Messiah. You ought to be able to see that. Bunch of hypocrites. Now, what would he say to us today, my friends, is we're seeing these things happening, and especially to, in, in Israel today. As we're seeing these things happening in Israel today, folks, the most excited people on the face of the earth ought to be born-again, Bible-believing, evangelical Christians today. Because we can see the sign fulfilling right before our eyes. Can we not? So we ought to be excited, just like Jesus said here. I looked at that uh, 
uh, that video, that movie, Wednesday night that we've been showing here on Wednesday nights. And I looked at the miracles that he did, and I said, good Lord. I mean, how he raised Jairus' daughter, and how the woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of his garment. I saw that, and, and that threw a little bit more light in the passage that we looked at in Matthew chapter 16. My goodness, you ought to be able to see all these things and know the signs of the time point clearly that I'm the Messiah. So my friends, what I'm saying to you today is that things that's happening, especially in Israel today, ought to be telling us that we're getting very, 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 very close. Do you believe that? Well, give me an amen. Y'all wake up. Good gracious. Wake up. We ought to be excited. Look, if you would, all of this is a harbinger, if you will, a foretaste, a preview of what's going to happen in the Gog and Magog war. Look, if you would, at the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38 and 39. And just look at the participants in this battle. Look, if you would, at, at, at the ones. And, of course, we know that this is all about that coming invasion. Now, I am not saying, don't go away from me and say, <coughs> excuse me, that the pastor told us this morning that what's going on in Israel today is the God Magog war that's found in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. I am not saying that. That is not what is happening today. I am saying that as a harbinger. Do you know what a harbinger is? It is a preview, a foretaste of events that's about to come. Now, I think this is a harbinger of the Gog Magog War. And the reason I say that is because of the players, the participants, these nations that are involved in this war. This is a latter days, a last days, last of the last days, latter days mean, invasion of Israel by Russia and several you know, Confederate nations with Russia is going to invade Israel. But if you look at this, and you look at the nations that are involved, and I'll just briefly look at this because we don't have time to look at all of them. But first of all, it says in verse two, the word, or verse one, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, talking to Ezekiel, Ezekiel the prophet, set thy face against Gog. Now that is just a, a title, if you will. It could, be, it could mean general, it could be commander, it could be Caesar, it could be president, it could be prime minister. It's just a title, not a, a, a proper noun. Set your face against Gog, but he is of the land of Magog. Now, if you go back and do research and study and you get books, Bible study books, you can get prophetic book, books of prophecy on this, and you can study all day long because there's so many books about this. I would recommend someone like uh, Dr. John Walvert. You could get Mark Hitchcock's a little bit more up to date. But they identify these nations that's found in this passage. And as you read the nations that's found in this passage, it looks like what is going on over there today and what's going to happen today but you see that all these nations are in place. Magog, for example, is probably referring to Russia. Tubal, the prince of Meshach and Tubal, probably talking about Moscow and another place in Russia. But he goes on to identify other nations that's going to come with them as they invade Israel. You see in verse 5, Persia, that is Iran, changed its name in 1935. Does that ring a bell today? Matter of fact, all these these these, na these nations should ring a bell and should uh, give you a warning today to show you how close we must be to these events that are taking place. But Ethiopia, which is the Sudan, Libya, and all of the Shia with them, Goma and Togomar of the North Core, this is all these nations is probably talking about Turkey. But these nations are going to invade Israel in the last days. Now, this is going to be the Gog-Magog war. Now, the reason that I say it's the last of the last days is because what's found in verses 8 through 11, we look at not only the players, but look at the timing of this event. The Bible says in verse 8, After many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt be come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste. Uh, but is brought forth out of nations, and they shall dwell safe in all them. Now, first of all, folks, beloved, who, what nation is being invaded here? It's Israel. If you'll go back and start reading in approximately the latter part of 35, 36, 37, 
you will see the prophets, prophecy that's been fulfilled in our generation, okay, our days. When Israel, the Bible says that Israel one day is going to be Israel again. It prophesies the national rebirth again of the nation of Israel, and that happened in May 14, 1948. All of this was not subject to happen before those days. Israel had to be brought back into its land. It's been brought back into its land. It's been reborn again. Nation, the nation of Israel is a strong, mighty, democratic force in that area of the world. And that had to be in place before all these other events could happen. But the reason we know that this is going to happen in the last days, and probably the clue of when it's going to happen, is found in verse, verses 9 on. Notice what it says. Well, the last part of that, verse 8, it says, all the, They shall dwell safely, all of them. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. And it goes on to say in verse, uh, look at verse 11. Thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil and to take a prey, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited. And upon the people that are gathered out of nations, talking about Israel, which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. Now, folks, when is this going to happen? It's going to happen in the latter days, as it says in verse 8. But it also gives us other clues of when it's going to happen. It's going to happen when Israel is at rest, when Israel feels like it's at peace, when Israel feels like there's no need to have up uh, uh, walls and such things as that and bars to protect them from invading forces. The reason we know that this happening today in Israel is not happening right now, uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39, is because Israel is not at peace. Israel is not at rest. Israel is not dwelling safely. Has there ever been a time that you can think of off the top of your head that Israel has ever dwelt safely since 1948? Has there, has there ever been a time that Israel will say, well, there's no need to defend ourselves. We don't need walls. We're dwelling safely. We are at peace with the rest. Of there's never, ever been a time like that. This is going to happen, I believe, when the Antichrist signs that peace covenant. And then after he does that, that triggers the tribulation. And I am hoping and praying and hoping and praying and hoping and praying more and more every day. That our theology has been right about the pre-tribulation rapture. Amen. Would you say amen to that? <laughs> but the facts are that all of these nations that are right now at war with Israel. And especially those, those terrorist nations. Backed probably by Iran and other terrorist nations. When you look at all that it tells us one thing. That listen the stage is set. Everything's in place. And we need to understand and realize that these events that's happened, they could trigger something like this happening at any moment of time. Now, that's what I believe. Now, we don't need to be so upset. We don't need to be so alarmed. We don't need to be chewing our nails. We don't need to be walking back and forth around the floor and say what's going to happen. I mean, it looks like it's all over for, for the Christians. It looks like it's all over for Israel. No, if you read on this passage, the rest of chapter 38 and chapter 39, you'll find out something's there. You'll look at the results of this war. And you know what the results is going to be? God wins. Israel wins. Jehovah God steps in and he takes care of business. The Bible says, in verse, beginning with verse 17, look, we'll see the results of this as it goes on in chapter 39. Thus saith the Lord God, art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel? Again, look at this prophesy, pro prophecy, which prophesied in those days, many years, that I would bring thee against them. In other words, you know who is bringing these invading forces in Israel? You know who is doing that? Jehovah God himself. Yahweh is doing that. You say, well, that don't sound right. That doesn't make sense. Why in the world would he be bringing these invading nations, uh, you know, 
Persia, Iran, Russia, God. May, why would he bring all these in? I believe for one reason only. To show the whole world it, that he is God. Look at the end of verse 16, if you would. Then we go back to where it was at. That shall come against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land. That the heathen, look at that. Do you see that? In other words, everything that's... Everything that we're seeing happening today, you might not believe this. Now, I know God's not pleased with what's going on today. I understand that. But everything that's happening today, my friends, and it's going to happen in 38 and 39 of Ezekiel, that God, may God more, is under the close direction and supervision by sovereign Jehovah God himself. He is the one that's directing. He is the one that's calling the shots. And even this, as bad as it is and as bad as it's going to be, and as bad as it's going to be in the next coming few weeks probably, God is doing it in a sense in His mercy to show the whole unbelieving world who He is. Look at the rest of verse 16. He says, I will bring thee, I'm going to bring you, Gog of Magog, and these other nations, these other Arab nations who probably are Islamic nations. I'm going to bring you against my land. Why? <laughs> that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee. I'm going to be set apart. I'm going to be glorified. I'm going to be exalted. I'm going to be magnified so the whole world will see who the one true God is one day. That's the God that we're worshiping today. And his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I shall be sanctified in thee, O God, before their eyes. Now, when they start this invasion, we can see the results pretty quick. Uh, you go back and see some of this in the previous passage. You'll see that God is going to turn even those invading forces against each other. He's going, to cause the, he's going to cause confusion. Look at what it says in verse 18. It'll come to pass at the same time when God shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. Why is that? Because that's his people. That's the land that he has given to Israel. They're his chosen people. The scriptures calls them the apple of his eye. And God says, uh, again, the promises that we looked at a few minutes ago. God says, I'll prosper those that love thee. They are still, that promises that God gave Abraham still holds true, my friends. And jealousy and the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Sure in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. So that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all the creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. They're going to be fighting each other. I will plead against him with pestilence and blood, disease. God says, I'm going to send that upon them. And then he says, I'll rain upon them, upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him. And overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself. And I will be known in the eyes of many nations that they shall know that I am the Lord, God says. They're going to see they're going to know. Aren't you glad you're on the right side right now? One day all the world, the Bible says, one day all the world is going to bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ and confess Him as Lord. That is Buddha, that is Muhammad, that is every other prophet. Whoever, they're going to bow the knee and confess that Jesus is Lord. And this is saying right here that God's saying, I'm going to show the whole heathen, unbelieving infidel world who God really is and I think we're going to see it before this to tell you the truth about it what do y'all think he goes on to say in chapter 39 and I don't have time to read all this but it's going to be so bad he's, he says in these, these verses that he is going to wipe out these invading forces that's going to be the end of Hezbollah that's going to be the end of Hamas that's going to be the end of ISIS. That's going to be the end of radical Islam. That's going to be it. It is Jehovah God. He is the winner over 
Islam's God, my friends, and say he leaves no doubt about it whatsoever. So we can rejoice in it. They come, listen, they come to bury Israel, but as a matter of fact, the only land, the only land part of the land that they claim as they invade Israel is a land that they're going to be buried on themselves. Amen. Isn't that true? Amen. It's going to take them seven months, verse 12 says, to bury those that are dead that's invaded Israel. Now, that's how it ends up. Now, I end with by saying this to you. You might say, well, pastor, what does all this mean to me? So what? Do you ever say that when we preach these prophetic messages sometimes? Do you ever say that to, you know, so what? What does it mean to me? Well, I'll tell you what it means to me, to you. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter real quick, because I ain't got but a few minutes. 1 Peter, that's why we need to start on time, amen? You got a long-winded preacher. 1 Peter, and, and this, this will bless your heart right here. At least it blessed my heart while I was preparing this. Because as I'm seeing all these things happening today, it's telling me one thing. Good gracious. The Word of God. This is the Word of God. What we're holding, what we're reading out of this morning, make it no, leaves no doubt about it. This is the Word of God. Amen. This is the Word of the living God. The written Word of God. Folks, this is God's Word. It is the inspired Word of God. It's, it's inspired. It's infallible. It's inerrant. It is the Word of God. And whatever it says in this, you can bank on it. You can trust it. You can lean upon it. It's true. Everything that's written in here is going to come to pass, just like past prophecies has come to pass. And this that's happening in Israel today, listen to me. You who are here, listen to me. You who are listening by radio, listen to me. You who are watching me by social media, listen to me before they turn me off. Listen to this. Peter says in first, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16, We have not followed cunningly devised fables, fairy tales, stories. We were made unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But were eyewitnesses of his majesty, Peter said. We, we were eyewitnesses. He received from God the Father honor and glory, talking about Jesus, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He's talking about when they want a man of transfiguration. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard, Peter says. We heard it with our own ears and we seen it with our own eyes when we were with him in the holy mount. We now, listen to what he says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Since we saw this, he says to these, to the readers of this letter that he is writing, the word of God has been made more sure. Y'all understand that? It's been made more sure. It is, it, it, it is it's telling us that everything that's happening is telling us that this is the Word of God. So this makes the Word of God, the prophecies that we have studied, the prophecies found in our Old Testament scriptures, Peter is saying, has been made more sure, has been confirmed by all these events that we are seeing taking place. Now, what am I saying today? I am saying to you this. All these things that's happening in Israel today, that's been happening the past week, these horrific events, this even this brutality, this slaughter. But I am saying that all of the players that's involved here is making this more sure. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? It's it's uh, it's confirming to us again that this is the word of God. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Where to now? So so here's the answer to the so. What does it mean to me? So what? So. Here's the answer right here. Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. He said, and he goes on to say that the, all these scriptures were written by holy men of God as they were moved along and as they were born, as they were carried along, as God spoke to them, his breath, as they penned these words of these scriptures. So, you need to understand this, he's saying. He said, it will, it will do you well if you pay attention to it. If you pay heed to it. That you would obey it. It'd be for your own good, that like a shining light in a dark place, 
that you would just listen to it and follow that light and do what it says in this word. Amen? So the first thing I'll say in closing to you this morning is this. Here's what it should mean to you this morning. Many, many years ago, me and Burton Medlin was fishing on a pond, <laughs> Fox's Pond. He said, how in the world would we come here? But we was out there on this boat, this little old flat bottom boat in the middle of Fox's Pond, and about 15 water moccasins started coming to our boat. I mean, they were coming from the banks of that pond. I said, what in the world are we going to do, Bert? He said, Donna, I think we better get our hearts right with God. <laughs> Just like that, and he was still fishing, though. He said, I think we're about to get our hearts right with God. <laughs> if you don't know Jesus Christ and you've never seen him as your Lord and Savior, you better receive him and get your heart right with God. I'm telling you, listen, I've been preaching this book now for 44 years. 42 years as a pastor. 47 years I've been preaching all together. And I've been preaching things that years ago that I would preach I couldn't understand and I, could, I had, had no clue how all these things would come to pass. But I just knew they would happen. I had sat on a good uh, Bible prophet that preaches and preaches that love the Word of God, that preach the Word of God, and they, pre they, they would say the same. I don't know how this is going to happen, but it's going to happen. But I'm telling you, as a preacher of the gospel, we are in the closing seconds of the day of grace. We're in the closing hours of the church age. If you were ever going to give your heart to Christ and make things right with the Lord Jesus, you better do it now. You might be here today and maybe you don't even know why you're here. Maybe God directed you here to make sure you get your heart right today with Him. If you've never trusted Christ, believe on Him right now. Paul and Silas uh, told the Philippian jailer when he asked that he asked him, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What did he say to them? Remember what he said to him? You need to get baptized and join the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem. Remember that? No, you don't remember because he didn't say it. He did not he, he didn't say, listen, you need to just be the best that you can be. And hope one day when you stand up there before the Lord that your good outweigh the bad. He didn't say that, did he? He didn't say you need to be a good father, a good husband, a good citizen. He, he said one thing. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Just like that thief on the cross. All that thief did. All he did when he saw these things that was happening around the Lord. He had a change of heart right there on the cross. He repented right there on the cross. Because the gospel counts said that he was joined, joined the other thief and all those Roman soldiers and Jewish leaders. He cast insults upon Christ as well. But Luke's gospel said, one of them had a change of heart. And he looked to the Lord. He said, Lord, you remember what he said? He said, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And what did Jesus say? This day, this day, this day, this day, you're going to be me in paradise. He died shortly thereafter. He was the first one to go through the courts of heaven and saying, Hey, there our redemption price has been paid by the Messiah, Jesus. And that rejoicing in heaven. Amen? Amen. That's all you've got to do. Call, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Man, if you're not saved, why don't you do that this morning? I'll be up here at the front in just a moment. And if you need to come and pray with me, you come and pray. And to those who are believers, I'll say this. We just started a new church year. And we ought to be excited. We ought to be getting excited. We ought to be ready to, to do what we can to build up the kingdom of God. Give out tracts. Invite people to church. I went to that car show yesterday. And there was a man, that, that one man in there. And he was giving out tracts. Inviting people to come to his church. We could do things like that, couldn't we? I went to the state fair on Tuesday. Half dead. But I went. Had a good time too. But as I was going in, there were some guys out there preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? We've got a short time, beloved. You better get busy. What did Paul say? Wake up. It's already past time to wake out of this spiritual slumberland that we're in. Make things right with the Lord today. Let's stand. It's bad. That's good. Father, Lord, we just are so thankful.
for your precious word. Lord, it just speaks to us. As sometimes we read passages of scripture like we read today and they just jump off the page and grab our heart. Lord, because we know that this is the word of God and it's so true, it's being fulfilled. We can just see it happening right before our eyes and gives us the assurance also, Lord, of our safety in Christ today. Lord, I pray if there's anyone among us today that's here that's never truly trusted Christ, never truly believed on Jesus, never been born again, never been saved, Holy Spirit, would you speak to their heart? Would you nudge their heart right now? And give them the courage, Lord, to maybe come up here to the front or even right where they're at just to call upon the Lord Jesus Christ and save them. Truly, if they'll do that, Lord, matters not whether they come up here, matters not whether they, whoever they are, whatever they've done, whatever they're doing right now, if they call upon the Lord Jesus Christ, he will save them. I pray for other believers that might be here today that need to make things right with thee, Lord. You know every need. You know every life. We just commit it to you and pray that you would have your way and your will in this time of invitation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.